Ambassador, it is a great pleasure that I accept today your letters of credence and welcome you to the Caribbean. Welcome and thank you. Your Excellency Ambassador Ervin Larocque, Secretary General of CARICOM, Ambassador Colin Granderson, Assistant Secretary General Foreign and Community Relations, Mr. Percival Marie, Director General Carry Forum, Mr. Charmaine Atkinson Jordan, Chef de Cabinet, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a great honor to present to you the letter by which His Excellency Mr. Ellis, the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs Commission, introduces me as the Please allow me to take this opportunity to convey to your relation between the Caribbean community and the European Union. Albeit virtually. I would have liked to present my letter in person as I think nothing can replace the human interaction. I truly hope that the day I will meet you and your staff at the CARICOM Secretariat will come very soon. I am, however, very grateful to you and to your team for having facilitated this introduction ceremony, notwithstanding the current exceptional global circumstances triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Your Excellency, allow me at the outset to extend my deepest condolences to your sisters and brothers of the Caribbean community family who have lost their loved ones in this epic global battle. With over 1,500 deaths across the region, the Caribbean nations continue to pay a massive toll. As we speak, the health, economic, and social consequences of the pandemic continue to ravage Europe as well as the rest of the world. Nevertheless, in the midst of the most challenging times, there is hope that we, the Caribbean community and the European Union, will emerge, emerge stronger from this ordeal. Secretary General, the EU and CARICOM have a rich cooperation as we have started working together 35 years ago. These were the times when Europe was marked by the grim realities of the Cold War, when nobody could even think that one day <clears throat> a Polish national born and raised behind the Iron Curtain would represent 27 member states of the European Union in this region. I'm humbled to have that honor today. In terms of our development cooperation, it is a reality that European Union has been since 1986 a staunch partner of CARICOM. Only the institutional support to CARICOM amounted to over 500 million euro. In addition to the direct funding, the EU has channeled billions to the region in partnership with CARICOM institutions, agencies, associate institutions, functional cooperation institutions and other regional stakeholders. This is a tangible support to the Caribbean people and their regional integ integration drive. History will judge, I hope, not on how much the EU has spent, but how we succeeded jointly in reshaping the opportunities within the regional, national and individual social and economic landscapes. We are entering a new crucial phase in our relationship. Soon, the Cotonou Agreement, in which our partnership has been grounded, will be replaced by a new, more comprehensive cooperation framework. The new agreement allows preserving key components of the Cotonou Acquis, whilst depending, deepening our partnerships at regional level. The length it has taken for the post-Cotonou negotiations to conclude is also a reflection of the high level of engagement and importance given by all sides to the new cooperation framework. Carving out a Caribbean pillar in the new agreement will allow us to better focus our attention and resources to those key areas of common interest we have identified to address them jointly and decisively. It will allow the European Union and the Caribbean community to play a more strategic global role and jointly address a number of global challenges, including climate change and security. Having reached this crucial moment, it is my pleasure to underline that the EU remains fully committed to supporting regional integration processes 
when it is in the interest of the partner countries to advance in this ambitious political endeavor. We are still going through the different phases of regional integration in the European Union, and in a way, we are still learning by doing. The EU citizens have seen the extraordinary benefits it can bring to their daily lives, but also the slower pace a consensus building approach to problem solving can imply. As representatives of regional organizations, we can understand um, that our aims and goals are set by the ambition and political willingness of our respective member states. This is as it should be, and it is always a delicate balance involved between individual interests and the common good. Sometimes this balance ends in a common minimum denominator, others in a stuck process, but oftentimes in a framework for a long-term growth as the European single market can attest to. The new EU financial instrument for cooperation called Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, the slightly difficult to pronounce acronym NDICI, is an ambitious drive towards facilitating actions that go beyond administrative limitations and give the ability to strengthen links at a triangular level as well. Latin America and the Caribbean are linked by more than uh, geographic proximity, and the EU is a key partner to all LAC countries, both politically and economically. We strive to increase interactions between our partners to be able to exploit lessons learned to the benefit of all, to make sure the relevant platforms are used to channel political messages at the most effective levels, to use the best expertise available to help advance processes in the region, with the region, and for the region. And DICI will help us better deliver on that. And we hope that our constant interaction with CARICOM and CARIFORUM will be instrumental in making the best of the tools at our disposal. Your Excellency, the COVID-19 crisis has clearly shown us that while geopolitical, physical, economic and cultural barriers may seek to divide us, our resolve to confront our common challenges must continue to unite us. Though great and diverse be our ethnicities, the bounds that unite us are stronger than these, as your anthem says. At the same time, at the end of 2020, the United Kingdom formally left the European Union. This is an occurrence which we in the European Union regret deeply, but this is the choice of the UK people and we of course respect it. Let me make it clear that the departure of the UK from the EU will not leave the Caribbean exposed. We will continue to be a strong partner to the region. We will have to be strategic in our collective vision as we strive to build an even more resilient region in areas such as climate action through our Green Deal, digitalization, sustainable growth and jobs, migration, governance, peace and security. Your Excellency, as we continue to create a more sustainable partnership in a post-Brexit and post-Cotonou reality, I understand that some recent decisions by the EU have negatively impacted a number of individual CARICOM members, notably the non-cooperative tax jurisdictions and anti-money laundering related listings. I have to recognize that the timing and uh, the global context have exacerbated the consequences triggering resolute solidarity reactions across the region. I will strive to pass on to our member states the concerns of the Caribbean, truly believing that we will find ways to overcome this and to look at the opportunities of our cooperation. I will be inspired in my endeavor by the words that you have put in a recent speech. All families have disagreements, but the ties that bind them are never broken. It is that family spirit of togetherness and determination that will get us through this exceptional time. In closing, I look forward to working with our CARICOM and CARIFORUM partners as we strive towards the successful implementation of our economic partnership agreement and of ongoing programs in areas such as regional integration, climate change, crime and security, education and health, including vaccination, to name only a few. 
I stand here today having the honor and privilege of representing the people of 27 countries of the European Union. I will do my utmost to ensure that during my mandate, we will together manage to build an even closer and stronger partnership. Thank you, Secretary General, for your support in this endeavor. Thank you. Your Excellency, Malgojato Vasilevsky, Plenipotentiary Representative of the European Union to CARICOM, the staff of the Delegation of the European Union, also my members of staff of the CARICOM Secretariat and CARIFORUM Directorate, I bid you all a good morning. Ambassador, I am honored to accept your letter of credence and to extend congratulations to you on your appointment as the plenipotentiary representative of the European Union to the Caribbean community. Our community places a high value on our partnership with the EU, and I am looking forward to our working together to advance the relationship that CARICOM and CARIFORUM and the EU have established over the years. Development cooperation has been the cornerstone of our relationship. The EU has been our leading partner in providing technical cooperation and assistance for more than 40 years. In that time, we have benefited from the development of our human resources, institutional capacity, regional integration, climate change and security, but to mention only a few. Most importantly, the programs and projects conducted under the European Development Fund over the years have been of immense value. They have allowed us to make significant strides in our efforts to integrate our community, particularly with regard to the CARICOM single market and economy. This continues as we seek to implement a program under the 11th EDF entitled Strengthening the Framework for CARICOM Integration and Cooperation Process Program. The EU has also made available significant resources to aid the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in the region. The timely provision of funds to the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CAFA, enabled the acquisition of sorely needed equipment and testing supplies. And I might add, more recently, the ability to make a down payment by some of our member states to the COVAX facility for vaccines. Very, very much appreciated and needed. Also, our member state, Haiti, has also received substantial assistance from the EU to help in its efforts to control the spread of the virus. We are deeply appreciative. The EU is also part of the COVAX facility, an effort to ensure that people in all corners of the world will get access to the COVID-19 vaccines once they are available, regardless of their wealth. Ambassador, you might have seen very recently a statement issued by our heads of government expressing concern that beyond COVAX, beyond COVAX, that uh, small countries such as ours are disadvantaged in being able to access the vaccine. I must extend the appreciation of a grateful community for the support that the EU has provided to enhance our efforts at building a resilient community. Excellency, your, our relationship goes beyond cooperation and technical assistance. We both treasure a commitment to peace, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. We cooperate in international fora, and this assumes great importance given the global agenda, which includes the sustainable development of small island developing and low-lying coastal states, SIDS, climate change, and the implementation of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Our relationship is codified in the Joint Caribbean-EU Partnership Strategy, which has as its guiding principles joint ownership, mutual accountability, solidarity, co-management, and co-responsibility. This cooperation can be further enhanced by increasing the political dialogue between the community and the EU. This is in keeping with the objectives of the post cotonou Agreement, as you mentioned, which has recently been negotiated between the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States and the EU with a protocol for CARIFORUM. This agreement seeks to build a more mature relationship which shifts the emphasis from a partnership based on aid to one based on equality. Excellency, both the EU and CARICOM have experienced tremendous challenges as a result of the pandemic. And I also want to recognize the, the tragic loss of lives in member states of the European Union. For us in CARICOM, the most travel and tourism dependent region in the world, it has been devastating. Economically, 
CARICOM has been acknowledged as being the worst hit region globally. Revenue losses associated with the virus average between 30 to 40 percent. The International Monetary Fund has forecast an average decline of 13 percent for the region, but some CARICOM countries will experience a decline as high as 20 percent. And it is projected that recovery will be slow. Exacerbating that situation is the inability of our member states to access critically needed development finance due to the use of GDP per capita as a principal criterion for such access. Indeed, that criteria, criterion has even prevented most of our member states from benefiting from the financial assistance in acquiring vaccines for the pandemic. I'm referring to the criteria in the COVAX facility. Of course, you have graciously assisted us, all our member states. We believe that vulnerability is a much more applicable criterion than GDP per capita. We strongly advocate that a universal vulnerability index be designed as a measure to determine access to concessional development financing. There's also a need for debt relief. Your voice in those fora in which those matters are being discussed and which CARICOM is not a member would be greatly appreciated. Along with the challenges posed by the lack of access to such financing, amid the task of staging a post-COVID-19 economic recovery, some CARICOM states have been added to the burden of being blacklisted by the EU. Blacklisting severely affects the economic prospects of the listed states and the community in general. We would like the EU to, to refrain from this harmful practice and instead pursue a mutually collaborative engagement towards our shared goal of effective tax governance and combating money laundering and terrorism financing. The dialogue can advance understanding in this regard. The support of the EU in these matters, particularly at this time, will be of great benefit to the community. Ambassador, there is much for us to continue working on to enhance even further the already strong relationship between our two regions. I can assure you of my full support and that of the staff of my secretariat, CARICOM and CARIFORUM Directorate. As I congratulate you on your accreditation once again, I wish you a warm welcome to the Caribbean and a most successful tenure in your role as EU Head of Delegation. I thank you.